This is an example of geothermal heat extraction from an aquifer. What that means is rather than just dry rock being hot and pumping water down, letting the water heat and bring it back up to generate steam, there's actually a significant amount of hot water already down there. And this is the aquifer. This is what's responsible for geysers like Gold Faithful. So this is the aquifer. And the thickness of the aquifer is going to be H. Here is the surface of the ground. A is still the area of below which you are drilling. Um, there is still, just like with the dry rock situation, there is a temperature called the minimum available temperature. The surface temperature is the same, T0 in this case is 10 degrees Celsius, and that surface temperature, that's where Z equals 0, and then as you go down, um, the temperature of the aquifer, or the temperature right here, right before the aquifer is going to be T2, and that's your maximum temperature, and then our distances are going to be Z1 down to the minimum avail available temperature, and then Z2 down to where the aquifer is. Okay, so in our case, we're, we're told that Z2 is 3 kilometers, and we're told that the thickness of the aquifer is half a kilometer. Okay. Now the difference here between dry rock in this case is the porosity. So this already has water in it, and so now the heat capacity of the aquifer, so of this layer here, is going to be C, A for aquifer, and this is M, C, A, where little c is specific heat capacity, so that's um, per kilogram, and then when you multiply by mass kilogram, this is just heat capacity. So this is in joules per degree Celsius, whereas little c is joules per kilogram degree Celsius, and that's what the specific means, it means per kilogram. Okay, now the this heat capacity of that aquifer depends on how much water there is, and so this is the porosity times density of water, specific heat capacity of water, plus 1 minus the porosity, so now this is the amount of rock, density of rock, specific heat capacity capacity of rock, and then you multiply this by the area and the thickness of that aquifer, so that's actually the volume there. Okay, so this P prime is the porosity, and in our case this is 5%, and so that's 0 0.05, and this is proportion that's water. So you have 5% water, 95% rock. Now that water down there can be under tremendous pressure, so it can be hotter than 100 degrees. Okay, so let's get the temperature. Oh, while well, we're doing equations, we'll do the equation here. So the available heat, just like we did for the dry rock situation, E0 is equal to Ca. E0 zero is equal to C A times T2 minus T1. That's just MC delta T. Okay, so that's the heat. Um, and the amount of heat available decays exponentially, just like it did with dry rock. But now we have a time constant tau A for aquifer. So this is the aquifer time constant. And that being whatever time units you're going to put T in. And this time constant for the aquifer depends on that heat capacity, the capital C, over the rate at which you pump the water out times density of water, specific heat capacity of water. So V dot is equal to the volume flow rate. 
and that would be in cubic meters per second. And then as usual, these are the density of water, and specific heat capacity of water. Um, okay, and so what else do we need? Um, the rate of heat extraction is exactly the same as it was for dry rock, rock so rate of heat extraction, which is just power, is DE dt. And so that's equal to negative E0 over tau aquifer e to the minus t over tau aquifer. Okay, and so those are all the equations that we need. So let's go ahead and work these things out for this example. So first of all, we need the temperature down at depth. So T2, 3 kilometers down, is going to be surface temperature plus the temperature gradient times the depth of Z2. We're told that temperature gradient is... 30 degrees Celsius per kilogram, and Z2 is 3 kilogram, kilometers, sorry, kilometers. So, okay, so T2 at depth is 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's basically the temperature of the water. Now, specific, the heat capacity down there, let's do it per area because everything is per square kilometer. So we've got uh, porosity, 0 0.05 times density of water, 1,000 times specific heat capacity of water, 4,200 plus 95% rock, 0.95 times density of the rock, 2,700, I'm running out of room here, times 840. But then don't forget we have to multiply by um, h, which is half a kilometer. Okay, that's h. And I've got the per area out here. Okay, so it turns out the heat capacity per area of overlying land is a huge number, 1.18 times 10 to the 15 joules per degree Celsius kilometers squared. Now you have to do a conversion. You're going to get meters squared out of that and you have to convert to kilometers squared which is going to be an extra factor of uh, six. Okay. So that's the heat capacity. Now the available energy initially is heat per square kilometer would be that heat capacity times T2 minus T1 per area. So it's the number we just got, 1.18 times 10 to the 15 joules per degree Celsius kilometers squared. T2 is 100 degrees Celsius. And the available minimum available temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. And so this gives us initial available energy, 0.71 times 10 to the 17 joules per kilometer squared. Okay, so that's the available energy per square kilometer of overlying land. Okay, now that that's not enough to generate steam actually. That's only just good for district heating. So they might use that to heat houses or in Greenland or in Iceland, for example, to run under the streets to keep the ice off the streets or something like that, or to heat buildings. Okay, so the next question is, what is the time constant? So the time constant for this aquifer, tau, is equal to that heat capacity per area divided by the volume flow rate per area times density of water, specific heat capacity of water. So it's the 
times 10 to the 15 joules per degree Celsius kilometers squared. The rate at which they're pumping it out is 0.1 cubic meter per second kilometer squared times density of water, 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed times 4,200 joules per kilogram degree C. And so this time constant turns out to be 2.8 times 10 to the 9 seconds. That's 90 years. That means if you didn't replenish any of the heat that you're extracting at a rate of 0.1 cubic meter per second per square kilometer, the amount of heat would drop to 1 over E of its value in 90 years. So that's a long time. Okay, so the power extracted initially, so power extracted initially would be dE dt per square kilometer at t equals zero. And so this would be E zero over A over tau. And then E to the zero, which is one. So it's that number we just got up above there. 0 0.71 into the 17 over 2.8 times 10 to the 9 seconds. And so this power is 25 megawatts per square kilometer. If you notice the dry rock case, it was 250, it was 10 times this, which could then be used to generate stream. But notice also that with the dry rock case, we were pumping water out at, at 10 times the rate here. So it's pretty well proportional. Okay, and then after 10 years, see how much power we're getting out. It's such a long time constant that this should not be that much different. So dE dt per square kilometer at t equals 10 years would be equal to the initial value, 25 megawatts per square kilometer, times e to the minus 10 years over 90 years. So that's years, years. And this turns out to be 22 megawatts per kilometer squared. So it hasn't declined that much. Okay, and that brings us to the end.